Bill Bernardi, the guy who invented the Lyricon, had this concept, the uh, psychology of imitation, that basically all sound, all, most instruments sound very similar. Che- if you cut the, the front off a cello, a saxophone, and a trombone, and you listen, you can't tell them apart. They're very similar. It's in, in the attack is where all the personality all right. is. Well, I can say maybe this time I will I will thank the Facebook groups um, because I would never hear about you otherwise. But man, am I so glad that I did because when I saw those videos you made up with the Lyricon, I was very, very surprised. Yeah, I, it was actually possible to make a living with Lyricon back in the day. <laughs> Is that so? I have no idea why anyone <laughs> would play one now, but yeah, you know, <laughs> you used to be able to do that. Yeah. You know, I, I come from the world of Iwis. Um, I know Iwi. Uh, I know a bit of the WX uh, controls as well, but a bit of Roland, but n- not too much about the Lyricon because it's just not it's not around anymore. Um, transducers they all use now, and the lip transducer. Um, and uh, basically in the beginning, the idea of the Lyricon was to create an electronic classical instrument. It had nothing okay. to do with wah-wah or anything like that didn't drive synthesizers, didn't do anything. It just had its own unique sound, which was great. I and mean, if you listen to what Tom Scott did with that, it, it was some great stuff. And you can actually hear it also on um, the uh, the Today Show. I use the, the actual Lyricon one for the flute sound and the violin and the um, uh, tuba those things because it's really good at acoustic instruments Mm. Um, because uh, you know it's uh, I I don't know if you can do that stuff on wind controls now because that thing was so intricately designed he even like I told you uh, he had measured the amount of silence between two legato notes on a saxophone Mm -hmm. if you are blowing and just change notes there's silence for about 10 milliseconds, between seven and 10. And if you don't have that, it doesn't sound acoustic. It sounds slippery, mm. you know? And that's why all wind controllers sound slippery because they don't have that. It's not available. You're using a synthesizer and synthesizers don't do that. Right. Most of them don't even play legato, so really. So, um, you know, it's a whole different thing. But that, you know, had no envelopes, no LFOs, nothing like that. It had um, just ways with the wind and lip to control the sound. And it was a great invention, but it really wasn't what people were looking for because basically, you know, sax players wanted something very different if they wanted anything at all. I mean, Mm -hmm. but um, Sonny Rollins did. He already, because I showed him, you know, they sent me out to show these guys it. So I would right. go to their homes and do a one-on-one demonstration. Wow. And he already had like modular systems and stuff. He was very advanced. Um, and, and he got with it. He was able to use it. But uh, in the end, I wound up taking the Lyricon 1, which, you know, back in the day, um, you either had one volt per octave or you had exponential, which meant every octave would double. And the Lyricon 1 was exponential because you could get better tuning on the scaling. You know, in the early days of synthesizers, you had to scale the thing to make it make it in tune in the octaves. It, it wasn't guaranteed that any synthesizer was going to be in tune. It just didn't mm. work that way. So you had to scale that stuff, tune it, scale it. And the um, Lyricon 1 was very easy because every octave had twice as much voltage to work with, which was how the Korgs were. That's why I used it with a Korg MS-20 and MS-50. I made a little modular system, had some outputs put on my Lyricon 1 and controlled those. And that was my first actual studio system to go out and play with. That's what I used on the Bob James things and with right. um, the drummer Harvey Mason, that kind of stuff. So that was- Yeah, uh, yeah. these recordings are, they're, 
great songs, yeah. man. I was very, very You heard surprised. Macumba, right? That one? Yes, I did. I heard I heard them all. Everything that you yeah. mentioned, I Yeah, I so that out. was and um that was that's actually the recording that when I look back and say, so did I ever achieve what I want to say? Yeah, I did. I played with my hero and he had me do three improvised solos on one tune. Oh, my God. <laughs> it was I did. it. <laughs> <laughs> but I worked with him a lot. He was uh, he, he's unbelievable to work with. I think I told you how when I did my first recording with him on a harvey mason record i took like these two solos mm -hmm. and he just listened and he wrote them out and put them together he said, play it like this now mm -hmm. and i had improvised it i had no idea but he wrote it out and i was able to put the two things together and there it was he's really an incredible incredibly talented musician bob james he's amazing really great wow. Great. And he makes you feel very relaxed in the studio. He's like as relaxed as you could be. So he's great to work with. Right. But um, you know, in uh, in those days, I was working mostly with Suzanne Ciani doing TV commercials, movie scores, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So that was like a a nine to five job. Just you know, we we would do two or three sessions a week, something like that. And they were, you know, I was working as not only is playing the Lyricon, but I was also the production assistant. So I would get the music out on the stands for everybody, make sure that everything was ready for the session when set up Suzanne synthesizers. So, so when she came in, everything was ready. Mm -hmm. I, I learned a lot about recording that way. Hmm. You know, being, um, one time we recorded at Rudy Van Gelder's studio in Englewood, New Jersey. Mm -hmm. And that was like, he would put on white gloves to move a microphone stand. I mean, this guy was very particular about things. And it was very, you know, he was very uptight. And then I said, oh, I saw those pictures of the John Coltrane sessions here on that staircase. And then all of a sudden I was his friend. So that was, <laughs> I was able to get in with him. <laughs> but it was something yeah. to be in that very studio. Mm. You know, that was that was something. How was it to, to, to use the Lyricon back in those days? I mean, in terms of just like, how, how did people react to them? How did the, the music well, scene react it to was, that? Well, you know, they didn't know what I was doing half the time. There was one session I remember where I was playing with, um, it was a, a big orchestra we had, and it was a woodwind section, brass and strings, and I was sitting with the strings, and there were like three violinists, and they were like, well, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm playing with you. And they said, well, that's not a string instrument. I said, why don't you listen to what it sounds like if I don't play? And then they play by themselves. They said, oh, my God. No, no, keep playing. Keep playing. Because I had a nice chorusing sound and it made the whole thing sound really big. They thought they sounded great, but it was really our combination of playing together. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you would there were um, all kinds of different situations. A lot of times you're not playing music. You're doing sound design. Like I had to make the sound of um, the visual was cells, someone cells in someone's arm. And, you know, I made this little bubbling kind of sound. And like the person from the edge said, how did you know what it sounded like? And I said, well, I listened really closely. I was listening to, I could hear the cells. So I, they would believe anything. They really, you know, they had, you're dealing with people who aren't musicians and they're in charge of everything. So, yeah. They would say things like put more when they wanted to say portamento, they'd say like Parmesan on <laughs> put more Parmesan on the sound. <laughs> so, you know, you have to you have to be very understanding of who you're talking to and how to uh, communicate with them, because not everybody's a musician. And a lot right. of times you would do sounds that um, I had to do the sounds of cockroaches being sterilized. That's an interesting I wonder sound. how that sound. It was like it was like a, a sound that would go bee, and it would have all that and it had to go down because it was you were destroying something, so it goes down, and it had to have a little bit of like uh, noise in the sound because you were doing something destructive. Right. And you know when you're working with visuals, it's a whole different concept than just playing music because when you're syncing to picture, right? Mm -hmm. And you're trying to get beats to fall in the right place. It never works to 
happen even a few milliseconds before the sound will never work. A few behind is fine because your brain is used to putting that together. Right. If you see someone across the street hit a hammer, your brain puts it together that that sound is the hammer, even though you don't hear it at the same time as you see it. You know, it's the sound moves slower than the light. Mm -hmm. But your brain automatically will pull that together, but it rejects if the sound is in front of the visual. That will not work for your brain. It will not accept that. So that doesn't work. So it's like you find out all these interesting things that, uh, for instance, if you have two pure sounds in a fifth, there's also a sound two octaves down that happens, a ghost note that mm -hmm. just happens. When you have perfect fifths up there, two octaves down, that note is happening. And if you write something against that, that like a minor second, it's not going to work because there's that note is there, even though you didn't, nobody's playing it. But if you have those two notes, that note is there. Different things you learn about that. It's amazing how complicated sounds are, you know, just in the terms of how sounds are created. And, you know, I studied waveforms and, you know, how, and you listen, you can't tell them apart. They're very similar. If in the attack is where all the personality is. Right. Well, what do they do? Like guitars, it's always loudest at the beginning. It's loud and then dies away. That's the envelope. They don't have any other control. They can't do it. So basically, it's a plectrum instrument, which is close to a percussion instrument. They Once they hit it, they can add vibrato, but they can't do anything about the volume. The volume is going to start to dip out. And that's that's the envelope of it. And uh, you have to think about how the instrument is usually played and what the instrument is capable of doing in order to psychologically imitate it. You know, if you want to really imitate acoustic instruments. So when these guys on the um, wind control thing say, well, which is the best one for a saxophone sound? I mean, really, it doesn't matter. You got to play it like a saxophone. I mean, I get a great sound on a, a VFX, which it's not really, it's like a, a sample player kind of instrument. And they have a decent sax thing, but you know, saxophones, when you sample an instrument, that note sounds the same every time you play it. And saxes don't work like that. It right. sounds different every time you play it because you might play it soft, loud. You might add vibrato here. Usually when you do use vibrato, you wait and then sort of add it in and get wider. Right. And all that stuff can be programmed on a synthesizer, but you've got to know that that's what they do. Could it, be that there are certain, that, could it be that there are certain instruments which can be easily sampled than others? Sure, like a xylophone. That's pretty simple because you've got that, it's that sound. And, you know, if you don't want to stretch the sample too far, you stretch it too, too far, it sounds like, you know, it starts getting like the chipmunks, you know, up high, it starts to sound silly. So right. if you're <laughs> sampling every minor third, maybe you could pull it off. But the thing about trying to imitate acoustic instruments, it's really, it's never going to be as good as the acoustic instrument because the acoustic instrument is completely imperfect. Right. I mean, do you play any saxes? I do. All <laughs> right. So, you know, a low B flat on a saxophone, you're not going to like come in very soft. It's going to go, whoa. Because that's yeah. what it does there. The middle D is usually a little stuffy. Uh, when you get to the top, unless you really got your shit together, the alto might sound a little strained up there. It's just, it's the nature of the instrument. It's right. just how it works. Because you're driving a, um, a, a wave, a sound wave through a tube. And that tube has certain things that happen. And that's just the way it is. It, it, it doesn't change um, on the one note, but each note is completely different. When you listen to it, it's, it's really different. Each note mm -hmm. is very different than the one before. They all have their own personalities. And uh, synthesizer is exactly the same on each note. Sample is the same. Every time right. you hit it, it's going to be the same. Unless you can put some kind of control into... Um, you know, how you deal with it. The business I was in of doing TV commercials, a lot of times I was doing sounds that were not music sounds. Uh, there was one thing I did for solar detergent that I just played an octave on the um, on the Lyricon driver with a lot of portamento, 
And then I took a knife and a knife sharpener and it went ring. And we mixed it together and that became their logo sound. Oh. And you know, it's sound design. You know, you're dealing with, you can add anything in to make it, it's the result that matters, not how you did it. Sure. And uh, a lot of times, you know, you'll be playing in a woodwind section. And when you're playing with other guys in a woodwind section and you're playing the, you know, the uh, wind controller, you tend to go along with them and their articulation. So you sound a lot more real, you know, because you've got somebody sitting next to you, like uh, George Marsh, who, you know, he played on sketches of Spain. You know, this is a serious player. This guy was on everything. He's a guy that played ba 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 da 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 on the Bob James thing for a taxi uh, on the ocarina, you know, mm -hmm. kind of like a potato with holes in it. <laughs> and he sounded beautiful on it. He told me he played 36 different instruments, 36, 36. wooden instruments. Wow. I mean, he played, you know, all the double reeds, all the saxes, all the clarinets, all the flutes. Right. And he was ready on any of them at any time. He was amazing. I got to play with him playing acoustic flute. And, you know, he gave me tips that made it a lot easier to sound good, you know, because, you know, you, you study with a, a regular classical flute guy and they're not going to tell you, oh, man, roll the flute, roll the flute to, for your tuning. Because, you know, when you go up high, the tu it's generally going to get a little sharper as you go up and a little flatter as you go down, because that's the way overtones work. And pianos don't like overtones. You got to go with the piano. And mm -hmm. it doesn't have that natural tuning that woodwind instruments have. So you have to bring it a little flatter up top and then you sound good with them. And he would remind me of that, which was essential to, because <laughs> when you're playing on a studio recording, right? They have one rehearsal with, there might be 30 guys playing and they say, okay, let's do a take. You don't want to be the guy that flubs something. So 30 guys have to play it again because mm. they're all getting paid a lot of money and it's very expensive to do it again. You know, you, everything's got to be first take. Right. It's really how it is. And, uh, you know, it's I, I got very good at doing that, you know, at doing first takes. I, when I worked with Suzanne, there was sometimes when I do lots of overdubs for something because we were doing it just the two of us and I was playing all the parts. And, you know, she'd say, let's see how many first takes you can do in a row. And I would, you know, I got up to like eight or nine first takes before I flub something. <laughs> it was like, well, that's pretty good. You know? <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I uh, got very good at playing what sounded like sequencer parts, you know, playing like because that was just starting then. And now, I've I've encompassed a lot of those kind of things into my acoustic playing. Like I'll play things like with swells on the saxophone that are more like a filter swell than what you'd normally have, you know, where I I'll put the sax more into my mouth and go, wow, and keep the tuning because that you got to keep, but you want the overtones to grow. And you know, you're really imitating a filter sweep, which is a lot different than there's certain things that the synthesizer has opened up my acoustic playing because I'll imitate things that, you know, you do with a synthesizer that just right. weren't in music before. And I think that's like uh, one of the things that musicians now have to incorporate. You know, there's a lot of sounds that are in the world now that weren't in the world a hundred years ago. And even 60 years ago, they weren't in the world, you know? Right. I mean, uh, when I first started the Lyricon, there was the mini move and the ARP Odyssey, the ARP 2600. There was nothing programmable that right. just didn't exist. And a lot of times I get called to come in and program the synth for the keyboard player because he had to play a part, but he didn't know anything about a synthesizer, you know, and there were no presets. So you had to make a sound on the spot. Mm. And that's how it worked. And a lot of people, uh, especially on record dates, they didn't want you to use a preset. They, they said, I want the sound made for my record. I want the sound for this record, not something that's going to be on somebody else's record. I want my sound, you know. Because... Okay, and, and, and that's, 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 that's an interesting thought because how, how, how do you do your sound? Like, do you come with a certain well, idea in mind and then you call somebody to help you? Well, do... you know, when I would get a synthesizer back in the day, 
Um, the first thing I'd have to do is make sure I could interface with it because a lot of synthesizers didn't have inputs and outputs for the voltages. So you might have to have them put on so you could send the voltage to it. Once you got it so you could use it with the wind controller, then I would program full banks of my own sounds. I, I never used presets. It just wasn't something that was ever a concept. That was a lot of keyboard players, you know, when the Roland D50 came out, it had a great sound or that the chord, you know, they have these sounds that were fantastic. They really were, but they were presets on the instrument. Everybody was using that sound. And mm -hmm. if you use it, it sounds just like everybody else. So like people like Stanley Jordan, he wanted his, a, a new palette for that, for his records. And that's what I did. You know, I would create sounds exactly to what they were talking about. And, uh, I, I did a lot of things with combining different synthesizers. So the keyboard player was playing, there might be a Fender Road sound, but there would be a swell that would come up. If they held the note, there'd be a swell that would happen that a Fender Rhodes really can't do. No. But since you had a second synthesizer, you could do that. And mm. uh, I learned, you know, in the beginning, there was only subtractive synthesis. That was it. And then they, when the Synclavier came in, it had FM, FM synthesis. Uh, before it had sampling, it was an FM synthesizer. And uh, then Yamaha came out with all those, the DX7 and all that stuff. And uh, it had a certain sound. It was very, um, it had a very clear, bright sound, you know. But I found that uh, I, I got the Casio, uh, I think it was the 8M and the 16M, which were also FM synthesizers. But I was able to get really nice string sounds out of it. And, you know, you learn to use the different um, types of synthesizers. Um, there's not much to learn about samplers except to sample. You know, you sample and you learn to cut it up and all that stuff. But in terms of programming the sound, if they don't have a filter, which a lot of them didn't, there wasn't that much you could do with the sample after you did it, except to control it. Mm. So samples were a little bit different to work with, but basically the whole thing in the end, you know, I, I, I did a, a, a synthesizer technique, um, a tape series for homespun tapes called the technique of the synthesizer, where I explained that if you thought of a synthesizer, like you've got a stereo system and the oscillator is the record. Okay, so there's a record there, it's playing. Now you can turn up the bass and turn up the treble and the treble is like the beginning of the low pass filter because you can take the treble off and the bass, if you take that off, that's like a high pass filter. And that's how those things work. And envelope filters are basically how the guy is gonna move that dial. And it's got, you know, it's a timing thing. He's gonna move it a certain way each time. And, you know, in terms of explaining to people how, what this, what does modulation mean? You know, what's, how do you get vibrato? Well, you know, when you take an oscillator down low enough, then it's cycling where you can't really hear it anymore, but it's sending out a pulse and you can use that for vibrato. If you have a, um, a triangle wave, you get vibrato. If you use a pulse width, then you get a trill. Mm -hmm. And if you use a, um, a ramp, then you'll get a good ba boo ba ba like that. So there's all different things, you know, in terms of how you're going to change that sound. And uh, you know, different synthesizers had different things that they came up with. Like there was Polymod on the Prophet Five, which was really cool. You know, it's a new kind of thing. But they were all basically the same: an oscillator mm -hmm. into a filter and an amplifier. That was right. about as complicated as they got. And uh, you know, to learn how to program them, starting with modular really helped me to know how the sounds worked, you know, because you have to, you know, even though it was, it, it had a signal path in it, you could break the signal pass and send the oscillator to the high pass filter instead of the low pass, things like that, and change mm -hmm. things around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you, you would know why the sound was doing something. Because, you know, once I had programmable sense, people didn't learn anything. They just pressed the button. That was it. <laughs> got a great sound. And, you know, if they opened the filter, that was programming to them. So they usually didn't start from scratch, but starting from scratch lets you know, basically, you know, how sound works because sound is a lot more complicated than people think about. You know, it's uh, when you think about the fact that you have a, um, an actual wave that's going through an acoustic instrument, 
Mm-hmm. And that wave gets disturbed when you change notes, which is why it shuts off for a few milliseconds because it suddenly is like, whoa, what happened? You know, and goes to a different, now it's at a different frequency. You know, at first it was moving at, you know, maybe 440 and now it's up to, uh, two, it's, at, it's up to uh, 880, an octave up. And it's like, whoa, you know, it, it's, it, it gets disturbed, but it comes back. And uh, when I practice saxophones and flutes now, I think about that wave because if you want to get dynamics on the instrument, you got to figure out how much you can push that wave on each note and how li- how softly you can play before the wave collapses. Because if you play too soft, it'll eventually collapse. A saxophone doesn't go to zero. You can get pretty good, but it doesn't go to zero. Not like a wind control. A wind control, you can do a complete fade out. Mm-hmm. You got to really practice to do that on a saxophone. It's hard. Yeah. Agree, eventually yeah. the reed stops vibrating and you're, you're left there like your pants fell down. You know, there's nothing there. It's gone. So, you know, there's. But, I, but, you, but I guess you mean more, more towards CV than MIDI when you say that, right? Well, you know, MIDI, when MIDI first came out, it was a revolution because all of a sudden, you know, you had all this stuff. And it was the same on every synthesizer, which was fantastic. It was so easy. You just put a yeah. plug in and it worked. That was like, wow. Um, but, you know, you're sending, you're sending a, a control because even with a MIDI, the wind controllers are actually putting out a voltage that's then changed to a MIDI signal. They're really voltage anyway, because that's how they all start, because you got to have something an analog something to start with before you transfer it into the digital realm, right. you know? And uh, that's why a lot of people now take um, CV outputs out of their wind controllers to control modular systems. They don't use the MIDI. They go back to that, which I, I find kind of, wow. They like to go back to that. It was such a pain in the ass. <laughs> why do they want to do that? <laughs> well, I mean, I guess for the feel. Yeah. For the, you know, it's, it's just the, it's just much more broad than MIDI, I assume. Well, MIDI is chopped up, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's ones and zeros. So, you know, even if it's going 192, you know, 192 samples per second, um, there might be a little when you're doing a modulation, you might hear that if it's not sampling fast enough, right. you know, your ear can catch stuff like that. Right. Sound is, um, the brain is very attuned to sound. It can, you know, you can get away with a much lower sampling rate for visuals. You know, um, film goes by at what, 32 frames or sometimes. Uh, uh, yeah, 36 or 24. Yeah, per second. Yeah. Sound, you got to go for a CD th- to get uh, 20,000, they have to go at 44,000 samples per second to get it to sound at all smooth. And even then, it had a very brittle sound to it, the CDs when they first came out. They got it better in the end. But um, nothing sounded like vinyl. Vinyl has that war- warmth. Um, you know, even on uh, when I recorded with Stanley, we recorded the rhythm sections on analog tape because the analog tape gives you that natural EQ and, and uh, compression that you've heard on every drum set you ever heard in your life and every bass and guitar. That's how it was done. Yeah. And whatever else you do, if you have it on tape, you're halfway there to the sound. And with digital, that's great for voices and orchestral instruments. But if you want to get that little bit of grunge in there, which also sounds good on a sax, it sounds good on anything, really. Tape right. does that. You know, it's, it's I had actually that. a great experience with a four-track cassette player one time. I actually made an album accidentally. Not, I didn't plan it, but I made a, a saxophone trio recording yeah online with a four track cassette player and man did did it sound great how did it sound that's how jumping jack flash was recorded um uh what's his name keith richards was practicing in his room into a cassette player and he was playing i think an acoustic guitar but into it it was distorting they got into the studio he got his lunch he couldn't get the sound he said look fuck it let me put it through the cassette player and they did that and that's the sound on the record of jumping jack flash it's this acoustic guitar, but it's played through this cassette player, and it sounds like an electric guitar, real perfect distortion. You know? <laughs> but you got to remember, people in the beginning, I saw guys stuff, they take paper and crunch it up and put it into the speaker for fuzz. 
Yeah. And people did that. Um, I saw people actually take a pencil eraser to tape, to fade a sound by taking the pencil eraser and just moving the magnetic particles off. Because, you know, it's a, the sound is actually magnetic particles on the tape. And you can screw around with them. You know, it's not like it's, uh, it, it doesn't get moved. It's, it's just pieces of metal. You can do stuff with that. Um, the, the first disco records, they used to make a drum loop on a like four track and they would cut the tape and that boom, 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 would just be there. The whole, because that's the way disco was. It was four on the floor, they called it. The bass drum was on the, on the downbeat. And so, boom, 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 boom. And they, the drummers got tired of playing that shit. So they just put it on a loop and they could play over it then. Mm -hmm. And it, it worked great until we got our first sequencers. You know, it was a, uh, back then, you know, you didn't play into a computer, you played into a sequencer and that played the synthesizer onto, onto the tape like that. Right. You know, Prophet had the first, I think, polyphonic sequencer. I mean, I remember when there was nothing polyphonic, everything was one note. That was it. <laughs> more than one note. It's impossible. But, uh, you know, it's, I was there for, all the different developments and you know it 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 is a very interesting story how electronic music changed in the commercial and pop music world you know it, it went through a lot of changes you know when you're when you're doing sessions and meeting different artists and stuff it's amazing how different different people are in the studio certain people like of uh, uh, like vangelis is unbelievable this guy you know, he'll sit there and not do anything, just set up all these sounds, and he sits down, gets quiet for a minute, and then a whole symphony comes out of him. I mean, just, he just does it. And you think, like, it's got to be written out. It sounds like Beethoven or something. It's too good. But this guy, that's the way he blows. He's amazing. I mean, he was an incredible person to play with. He was just incredible. Wow. Very, very talented person. And his whole thing was just, you get all the sounds you want, and then you sit down and you do it. And that, that's how, like he wrote Chariots of Fire, you know, that was a big hit. Um, and I asked him, how long did it take to write that? And he says, how long is the tune? I said, three minutes, 47 seconds. He says, that was it. So I sat down in the studio, got the sounds, and I, that's the first take. That was it. Done. Wow. Seriously. But see, he's got the maturity to be able to hold back. You know, a lot about getting that kind of a sound like Miles Davis or Vangelis is they don't let it all be seen all at once. They hold back and they make you wait for it. And that's really, really takes discipline, you know, because, you know, you want to play something, so, you know, cool. No, 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 they're not going to be cool. They're going to be really disciplined and build up to something. And when you hear a guy like that, it really lets you know about maturity in music. They really have a they're unconcerned with you thinking that, you know, oh boy, you can really play your instrument. They're there for the music. They're there for the music and that's it. You know, what really says what I want to say? And if if it's one note, that's okay. That's okay, you know? You know, and Miles Davis was never known as a technical trumpet player. I mean, he was 18 years old. He's on the stand with Dizzy Gillespie. Hmm. He, he had no way of competing with that. It was impossible. And Charlie Parker, I mean, you know, it was it was impossible. So he had to go a totally different direction. There's a great, um, on Netflix, uh, um, a yeah, documentary yeah, about Miles. You saw that, right? Yeah, yeah, I saw that. So, you know, that's really how he did it. You know, he, he went a different direction. I studied with Lee Konitz, mm -hmm. and he had a very cool sound. And that's what Miles was looking for. He wanted it to yeah, yeah. be cool. And uh, great, man. You know, it was music is the older I get, it's the more I see that you don't need to do too, you know, you, what you need to do is play the melody you hear in your head. That's really what you got to get good at is hearing what comes next, not playing something you know. That has nothing to do with the solo. I mean, if you're doing that, then you have lost your ideas and you're just playing riffs. So I was never a riff guy. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you can listen, you know, as you're playing and just hear, you'll get the right thing to play. Your brain will tell you because you know what you like. And you'll, you'll if you can play that, 
instead of like, you know, playing a pentatonic run, it's going to sound a lot better, you know? And, uh, you know, when I was younger, I didn't realize how important dynamics were. Dynamics make everything sound so dramatic. I mean, if you play soft and then build up, oh man, it's just, it's a whole other world. I agree. You know, a lot of guys, you know, they play saxophone and it's just, you know, it's just at that volume. But if you play like with dynamics, you pull the person in, you pull them into you because they lean in when it gets softer. And then, oh my God, at middle volume, it's so much more impressive, you know? Right, 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 right. Because it's all about contrasts. 